you have your Bibles with you, I'd ask you to turn to the book of Judges. Judges chapter 3. And we're going to begin reading in verse 12. Judges chapter 3, uh, beginning in verse 12, the Bible says, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon and the king of Moab against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. And he gathered unto him the children of Ammon, of Ammon and Amalek, and went and smote Israel, and possessed the city of palm trees. So the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, eighteen years. And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjaminite, a man left-handed, and by the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon and the king of Moab. But Ehud made him a dagger which had two edges of a cubic's length, and he did gird it under his raiment upon his right thigh. And he brought and he brought the present unto Eglon, king of Moab, and Eglon was a very fat man. And when he had made an end to offer the present, he sent away the people that bear the present. But he himself turned again from the quarry, from the quarries that were by Gilgal, Gilgal, and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king, who said, Keep silent, keep silence. And all that stood by him went out from him. And Ehud came unto him, and he was sitting in a summer parlor which he had for himself alone. And Ehud said, I have a message from God unto thee. And he arose out of his seat. And Ehud put forth his left hand and took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. And the half also went in after the blade and the flat closed upon the blade so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly and dirt came out. I'd like to preach the Lord be my helper this morning on the thought, the message that comes from the Lord. Dear Lord, we thank You and praise You for all Your goodness and Your watch care. Lord, we thank You for the church, Lord, and what she means to us. And Lord, we pray that You would allow it to mean more to us as the days go by. Lord, we pray that we be always conscious to hear Your messages to us, Lord, that uh, we have tender hearts and receiving hearts of what You have for us to hear. Lord God, we pray that You would bless this Word to Your hearers. Lord, that You would cause it to be a message that came from You and not from me, Lord, and that we might praise You for it. For it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Now, uh, let me just say this in the beginning and we'll get into the text that God still speaks to His people. Now, if you follow the history of the Lord Jesus Christ, He's never spoken to pagans because they're not His. He's not interested in them, but God still speaks to His people. Now, it may come in a varied amount of ways, and we'll see that by the Lord's help this morning, but God still sends messages to His people all the time. In the, uh, verse 12, the Bible says, and the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. Now, uh, as always, during the book of Judges, they had this on-again, off-again relationship with the Lord God of heaven. Uh, a good judge would rise up and, and, and serve the Lord and give them messages from God, and then he would die or get killed, and they'd go right back into their paganism. And you know what? That's still characteristic of God's people today. And whether we want to accept it or not, we like paganism. Uh, I just said something about pictures or supposed pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what? That's paganism. We shouldn't have any interest whatsoever in seeing some long-haired hippie supposed to be the very Son of God. That is paganism. We're in the most pagan season there is right now. Everybody wants to ride my back about it. I've even had pe pastors older than me say I'm missing the boat. No, I'm not missing the boat. It's paganism. Anytime you bow toward anything, that thing becomes an idol and you become a pagan. And so we see then that uh, that's just the bend of mankind. It has always been His desire.
desire to worship something, and even the, the most stark atheist it is, you know who he worships? He worships himself. Mm -hmm. He puts himself above God. So there's just a man's being to worship, and they were in this time of idolatry. Uh, and the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, I want you to try this on for us, is that uh, who they're dealing with is God's people. And the result is that they're under bondage. Now, uh, you know what? God's people can still get under bondage today. And I don't mean nationally. Uh, I thank God for the USA, but don't ever convince yourself we're a Christian nation. I don't like what Barack Obama said about our nation, but at the same time, our nation's largely pagan. It really is. And, and so we, uh, we, we, we still must understand uh, that that is our nature, and judgment well could be coming. Verse 13, And he gathered unto him, meaning, uh, meaning Eglon, and he gathered unto him the children of Ammon and of Amalek, and went and smote Israel and, pres and possessed the city of, of palm trees. Now, again, I want you to see that their desire, every pagan desire, is always to wipe out Israel. And it's still that way today. That's why our president got some people fired up this week. Is because they hate Israel. You know what? It is an inbuilt desire for the pagan to hate hate God and to hate God's people. <laughs> yeah. That that that's just part of it. And, and you know, uh, it, it always amazes me, but it really shouldn't that that people despise Israel the way they do. But that is again. Their nature. Verse 14, So the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. But when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer. Now, I also want you to see, it always takes God's people a long time to get sick of sin. You know what? Uh, we can say what we want to, but in this flesh carnality, we enjoy sin. We enjoy what it gives us. We enjoy what it does for us. We enjoy sin. You know how long it took them to get sick of it down in Egypt? 400 years. And they finally got sick enough. And here with Eglon uh, uh, doing his things to Israel after 18 short years, they say, hey, I'm sick of this. You know what? You want a revival in 2017? Let me tell you how one comes. Is you getting sick of sin. You getting sick of the rewards of sin. Then revival will come because God's always sent a deliverer. He, he, he's faithful to do that. But in order for that to happen... We must come to the place that we're sick and tired of sin and being ruled by it. Verse 15, the rest of it says, uh, Ehud, that's their deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjaminite, a man left-handed, and by him the children of Israel sent a, a present unto Eglon, the king of Moab. Now, uh, <laughs> watch your vanity. Because the reason that Eglon got taken is he liked presents. He liked pats on the back. They, they, they knew Eglon's character better than he knew himself. And they knew we can get in there if we give him something. If we take him something, he's going to open the door and he's going to let us in. And so uh, they, they knew his character and they knew the buttons to push and so they did just that. Uh, but Ehud made him a dagger with two edges of a cubic length. Now, I'll give you two things from that. Watch your presence. <laughs> you know, uh, I have a really... The Lord's blessed me with a really good church. Well, if, if you, uh, but watch your presence. You know what I have found, especially in, not this, but in my secular work? <laughs> the people that run and give the boss a presence is usually the problem. Uh, that, that, that's usually that's usually what the case is. So Ehud 
uh, knew exactly what, uh, what what to do. And I also said that I also want you to see you made him a dagger. See, uh, if we're going to serve God the way that He desires to be served, you're going to have to have some kind of plan. You know, the one thing about sovereignty is uh, it's just like God's going to cram everything right down our throat. That's not true. See, Ehud knew what had to be done, so he made a plan to how to get it done. And not only did he make a plan, he said, well, you know what his plan was? I'm going to stab and kill Ehud. I, I, I mean, I, I'm going to take care of the problem. And you know what? It was to such a point he even had to build something to get the job done. You know what? That takes a little bit of time. So this morning, do you, do you have a plan in place that you're going to serve the Lord? Because see, the thing it is, if you don't, you're not. If you don't have a distinct plan, you'll waste the bulk majority of your life on something that amounts next to or less than nothing. If you don't have a plan, it, it won't happen that way. So I want you to see Ehud had a plan to take care of the problem that was, and the problem was Eglon. He was going to take care of him. Now, verse 17, And he brought the present unto Eglon, king of Moab, and Eglon was a very fat man. And when he had made an end to offer the present, he sent away the people which bear the present. And so I want you to get the full picture of what's going on here is that Eglon has a group and Ehud has a group. Somebody, uh, I don't know how many men, the number of men brought the present in to, e uh, to Eglon and Ehud had a group there that helped him bring it in and he dismissed them. And then Ehud said, Eglon, I got a message from God. So then he sent his out. You know, it, 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 it sometimes, and you know what? This is the truth. Ehud did have a message from God. Now, it wasn't what Eglon wanted to hear, but it was a message from God. And you know what? Sometimes the message He sends us is not the message we want to hear, but it's still a message from God. And we, as the Lord's people, are still receiving messages from God. And we'll see in a minute, the bulk majority of the truth comes from the uncompromised Word of God. But whether we want to accept it or, or not, He does send messages other ways. You know what? I've been through that book cover to cover. And not one place in that Word does it say, Larry Lafferty, I want you to preach the glorious Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he told me. You see what I'm saying? And so then we as the Lord's people, what we need to do is look for the Lord's messages because His messages will guide us, His message will direct us, and, and, he, and we can be in the center of God's will when we follow what He's given us to do. And so I want you to see that we as the Lord's people are, are the center of what we do should be following the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to see in verse 21. Uh, excuse me. Uh, verse 19. But He Himself turned against from the quarries that were by Gilgal and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O King. Who said, keep silence? And all, and all that stood by him went out. Now, sometimes a message from God is very easy to deliver. Sometimes uh, when you begin to speak on the glories that are yet to come and, and standing in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Almighty God of heaven, you know what? That, that, that is a wonderful thing. But when you, when you have to preach, you must be born again. That's a little bit more difficult. Everybody says, well, that's a glorious message. Yes, it is. But if you preach it right, this is the fact. I contributed nothing to my natural birth. That was the actions of my mother and father. And this is the truth, whether we want to accept it or not. You can contribute nothing to your spiritual birth either. 
So, you see why some messages are great and fun to preach, if you will, and some of them are a little more difficult. So this message that Ehud had for Eglon, you know what? <laughs> it's kind of difficult to deliver. And he... Uh, it says the, the, the knife was eighteen cu- was one cubic, which is about from here to here. And it said when he ran it in, he lost it because he was so big. You know what? Sometimes the Word of God is biting. It hurts. You know what? That, that, that wound that Eglon had, it, it, you know, when we read stuff in the Bible, we almost read like it was, like it was you know, just a fairy tale. But you know what? Eglon was stabbed with an 18-inch knife and it remained inside of him. That's a real thing. You know what? I've never been stabbed with anything like that. But could you imagine the excruciating pain that Eglon experienced? That's a real deal. And not only is it a real deal, it was God's plan. It was God's plan. And, and so then we as the Lord's people uh, ought to take very seriously looking for the message of God. Looking for what He has for us. What He is saying to us. Now go with me to the Gospel of John. John chapter 1. Very familiar verses of Scripture. But I want to review them and be sure that we get the full meaning. John chapter 1 in the very first verse Gospel of John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word. Now, let me say this, uh, everything else settled, all the dust, doesn't matter what else is going on around you, no matter what Aunt Polly said, and, and what this one said, and that one said, in the beginning was the Word. In other words, this trumps everything. The Word of God trumps everything. I don't care what you feel. I don't care what somebody told you. If it's in the Word of God, take it. And if it's not in the Word of God, leave it. You know what? When, when the Lord, when the Lord said, uh, when the Lord God said to the uh, the nation of Israel, "Come out from among them," it meant leave that pagan idolatry. But who, who carried your pagan idols with her when they headed out? Does anybody know that? It was Rachel, yeah. the one that he supposedly loved the best, <coughs> and, and she loved him so much she gave her life for it. You know why she died in childbirth? I'll tell you this, because she was a pagan and she did not love God. And that very choice of Him marrying her was made completely in the flesh. And God took care of the problem. So, first of all, understand and know, in the beginning was the Word. The Word trumps everything. The Word of God. If somebody says, I've had a vision and it's contrary to this, you can write her down, they're lying. They're wrong because this trumps everything. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now can you imagine that? That as you pick this up, and and some of you don't even pick it up from one season, from one Sunday to the next, but, but as we hold this dear book, we're holding the very character and person of God. Shouldn't it be approached carefully? Shouldn't it be approached with some, with some care and desire for understanding? Certainly it should. The same was in the beginning with God. In other words, the very character of this book has always been. And we should be very, very, very careful how we read it. We should read it with no, uh, don't matter what Uncle Johnny said, don't matter about anything, just take it for what it says. This is the Word of God. Verse 3, All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything that was made, anything made that was made. Now, that middle verse seems to be focusing on creation. But see, don't, don't, don't take it just as creation as in the beginning uh, God created the heavens and the earth. Because see, there's a lot of cre- false creators out there today. Uh, you, know, you know why the Catholic Church is accepted as the, as the base of all churches? Because there's a false creator. You, you, you know why uh, 
uh, we're fixing to go through this season of uh, Christ Mass. You know why 99% of Americans take it as the very day of the birth, birth of Christ? It's because there's a deceiver out there. And, right. they, and, and, and they take the, they, they, they messed up. That they're taking it. You know where the creator of that mess is? It goes all the way back to Druidism. Jeremiah chapter 10, the first four verses, lays out your little Christmas tree to the T. Mm -hmm. And you know why we you know why we still want it? Because our flesh is sinful. The heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? And so then we as the Lord's people, we need to understand and know, again, this Word says what it is, and this should be our base for all things. Verse 4, In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now, I want you to, to, to get that full concept is this, In Him was life, and... His and, 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 and the light of men. Now, you know what? Some people are never ever going to see the light. You know, you, you hear that old song, I saw the light. We all like to sing that because it's got a good little jingle to it. You know, sadly, most never see the light. The Bible, in fact, says, and men love darkness because their deeds were evil. And so, then we as the Lord's people, if you've seen the glorious light of the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've seen Christ for who He is, give God great praise and great glory this morning because it's not of yourself. So, do you know Him? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you, are you in an intimate relationship with the person of Christ? Because that hinges on everything. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Now, if you don't know Christ, I'm here to tell you this morning, you're still in darkness. And if you can't say unequivocally, yes, I'm saved. You're still in darkness. Uh, in the stillness of the night, if you don't have an intimate relationship with Christ, you're still on your way to hell. And, and, and so we see then that, that the very base thing that we can, that we can base our, our, our relationship and base, base the truths of the Word of God are in this book. And a lot of what we take as downright plain gospel truth is just not in here. What does the Word of God say? When did the church start? How do you get into it? Was the thief on the cross in the church? Did he go to paradise? What's paradise about? This paradise still exists today. It's in the Word. It's in the Word. You, you better know what this Word teaches because you know what? <laughs> Remember the old false prophet and, and the young prophet? The young prophet was to go in and give him a warning and keep going out the same uh, The opposite, just make a straight trip through. But that, that false prophet said, Oh, I'm a prophet as you are. Come in. And eat his spell. And see, the thing that is, it cost him his life. And if we're easily swayed, what it's gonna, what it's gonna cost you is your spiritual relationship with Christ. Does that mean you're lost again? No, if you're not, if you're genuinely saved, it don't. But I'll tell you this, you'll live a life most miserable. And, and most of that group probably never was saved to start with. And so then we as the Lord's people use this as your benchmark. Not what brother so and so told you or what their interpretation is. It You use the book and that's it. So that's our basis. That is our basis for everything else. Now go over to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And I'm going to read verses 14. Verse 16. Romans 8, verse 14, the Bible says this. 
For many, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now, we have the Word of God, and now we have the Spirit of God. And I want you to see in your King James Bible, that's the big capital S, Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit of God, or the Holy Ghost. And I want you to see that uh, the individuals are led by Him. Now, I want you to see that this is individualistic to people who are redeemed. In other words, he's not going to lead lost people. Don't ever, don't ever, don't ever think a lost person is going to get led. Now, I will say this: when an elect is being dealt with, the Holy Ghost is the one that does it. So, if you have that urging in your spirit to know unto the person of Christ, that's the Holy Ghost, and He's always very faithful to do His work. But I want you to see that the Bible, the Bible says here very plainly that. Uh, that uh, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now, I have a lot of people say there's no way you not can know. Well, the Bible here says you can know. Does He bear witness? Yes. Or does He bear witness? No. You can know if you're saved or if you are a child of God. And that is being saved because He told me to do this. She must be born again. And that's what being a child of God is all about. Being born again. It doesn't matter if you're a Baptist. It doesn't matter if, you, uh, if you've been dunked or if you haven't been dunked. The question is this. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? And so he, he makes it very, uh, very plain. Then we have the Word of God. And then we have the Holy Spirit that we can also rely on. Verse 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now, I want you to see there it says the spirit of adoption. Again, your capital S, Spirit. Now, I'll go this much further too. If you don't know what I'm talking about, make a call in the election show. Because if you don't have an acquaintance with the Holy Spirit, you're probably not saved. Because that's not accomplished. Being so, you know, that, that, that's one of the things hated by sovereign grace and, and depending on uh, the Lord God to save your soul is there's no decision to make because the decision is made in eternity. So that, that, that leaves this that we can only say is Him speaking to us and letting Him know that you're His and He'll regenerate you. And that comes by the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit speaking to you in a very intimate and real way. And so, uh, how do you know you're lost? Yes, the Word of God says that we've all gone astray and we're all on our way to hell. How do you know that, the, the, that Jesus is the means of salvation? Well, the Bible says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father by me, but what makes it real? The Holy Ghost. Yeah. Right? My children knew those verses before they could even remember. But you know what? It didn't make them regenerate. It didn't make them born again until the Holy Spirit came their way and made them a new creature. And that is the difference. So you know what? <laughs> you can depend on the Holy Spirit. But listen to me in this. It will never be contrary to the Word of God. So these people that say, well, you know, the Holy Spirit led me to, to write another chapter on to the end of the Revelation. Well, you can mark her down. They're wrong. Yeah. Because they will never be in violation of each other. They'll always be in unity. Remember, me and the Father are one. They'll always be in unity. But don't ever, don't ever minimize the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost because... He can let you know some things very, very specific to your life. Because remember what I said, there's no Scripture that says in the Bible, I want Larry Lafferty to preach. So how did I arrive at that, at that, 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 that thing? How did I know that it was the mind of God for me to preach?
preached the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The way that came to me was by the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. And see, and it was inconsistent with the Word of God. Uh, we, and, and you know, I'll go a little further out in the branch. If a woman says that, you can write her down. She's wrong. Mm-hmm. Because you know what the Bible says? I would that they were in silence. For it is not permitted for them to steal. Right. So you can write her down. If that's what she's telling you, they're wrong. They're the, because again, these two entities will always be in exact uh, in exact unity in what they have to say. And so, I'll tell you this this morning, you can depend on the Holy Spirit to guide you in the direction of the Word of God. It will always be that way. It will always come out that way. Uh, verse 16, The Spirit beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. What a wonderful, wonderful thing that is. Now go to, me, to Romans chapter 9. In the first verse. Romans 9, in the very first verse, the Bible says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. Now, now did you get that? That my conscience bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. How did you arrive at the conclusion that you were lost? Well, I arrived at it like this. The Holy Spirit bearing witness in my conscience, saying, you know, you don't have nothing. You may have had a little false profession along the way, but you don't stand in the presence of Christ. That, 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 that got my attention. And it ought to yours too. Right. See, if, if, if you've never had anything like that, you're probably not saved. Uh. And, and so we find then that... Uh, we need a very personal knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. A very, you know, that's really what a bunch of these old false churches such as, uh, uh, and I don't mind naming them, uh, the Catholic Church and the Lutherans and the Episcopalians and the Methodists, you know, that's the difference between them and us. They don't understand a personal knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's just a big general character that they generally come to and that they generally worship. But you know what? That'll land you right in the middle of hell. We need to know Him personally. And the Bible says here that we can. That, that, and in fact, if we don't, <laughs> we never been saved to start with. Verse 2, That I have... Gr- and I say truth in Christ, I lie not my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ... For my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. And so he was very, very uh, upset that Israel didn't get it. That Israel didn't understand and know the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what? Sometimes if you let the flesh get in control, you'll get upset too. Why won't little Johnny just see it? Well, little Johnny don't see it for the very same reason you never saw it till God opened your heart. And you know what? There's not one iota that you can do about it. Right, amen. And, and so then we as the Lord's people, we, what we really need to pray for is that the Holy Ghost might show them because that is the only way. You know what? I've always brought my children to church. There's not one of them here this morning that can say they ever remember not being in church. And that is my duty to train them up in the ways that they should go. But you know what? It is not my responsibility to save their souls. And the reason why is I just can't do it. See, Paul wanted to, but he knew he could. And so then we as the Lord's people, we need to understand and know that how how needy we stand this morning in need from a touch of the Holy Ghost that the Lord might might do a work in us. Now go with me to uh, 1 John. Uh, 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter, excuse me, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. First uh, John chapter one, uh, verse five. 
The Bible says this, this is the message which we have heard, to, heard of Him and declare unto you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. Now I want you to see two entities working together here and, and, and we're fixing to get to the last one. John was a preacher. He's the one that we read about in the beginning. He said in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. Here, here, here he, he makes a reference again of that very first message that, uh, that he knew God. That he understood and, and knew the character of God and, and knew who he was and, 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 and had an intimate personal relationship with him. Then, uh, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Right. Now, uh, Brother Junior made a little, uh, uh, a little uh, uh, reference to the Masonic Lodge. All they are is a bunch of Baalists. Now, if there's no darkness at all in Him, why did they do everything in such a big secret? Hmm? Oh, mayor, amen. And so we see then, we see then that, that the Lord doesn't work that way. It's a very light and public thing in Christ. And we should not, we should not be, uh, we should be very wary of people that's not like that. Verse 6, If any man say, we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness. We lie and do not the truth. Now, another little hardship that you easy believeism, you know, uh, say this little prayer with me. And they say your little prayer and next, you know, ten years later they high on dope and drunk as Cootie Brown and wrapped it around a, uh, an oak tree somewhere over there in Houston County and then a preacher get up and preach him into glory. You know what? Darkness is darkness. Whether we want to accept it or not, and you know what? If that is their character and that is their life, all we conclude is that they remain... You know, that's what Paul said concerning Israel. They remain in darkness still. And, and, and those individuals like that, there's nothing for us to say, uh, but uh, they had no fruits. And so he says very clearly that God's people will follow Him. Verse 7, But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, <laughs> and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from sin. Now, I want you to see the connection there in verse 7 because it talks of, it really refers to the atonement and walking after Christ. And you know, there's a lot of people today that claim the atonement that live like dogs. I read stuff on the internet where the filthiness of sodomy, that they have their own stinking, ungodly churches. You know what that is? That's a stink in the nostril of God. And they, and I don't say this very often, but I'll simply say this, they're not saved. They're just not. Yeah. And, and so then we as the Lord's people, and don't, don't you ride in on grace to, to approve your filthiness. Don't you claim the blood of Jesus and the unmerited favor of God for your sin. Because the Bible is very clear here that good works would follow them. Verse 8, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar. And the Word of God is not in us. So I ask you, uh, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Is the Spirit making intercession? Well, let me say this. It's the Spirit identified with you because Christ is the intercessor. But does the Spirit deal with you? You know, and, and we should never ride on emotionalism, and there's just as much guard against it as the flip side. But if you go in these churches and they're just... and you're almost afraid to move, be sure you're breathing right and look around and make sure you... You know what? Uh, I don't find that anywhere in the Word of God, do you? Certainly the Bible says do everything decently in order. 
But it also says lift holy hands. Yeah. It also says pray without ceasing. <laughs> so then we as the Lord's people, we need to understand and know, are we, are we in the will of God? Are we, are we following the Holy Spirit? Is He sending us things to do? Or is He not? And that's where we must be. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Now, I personally think the Corinthian letter in the first chapter outlines the Catholic Church as closely as anything you'll find in the King James Bible. Uh, you'll see that there was a, a, a suspected problem. Or actually, I'm sorry, that's Romans. But uh, 1 Corinthians, he sends them a very scathing letter. Verse 18, he reminds them of some things. For the preaching of the cross to them that perish but the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness but unto us which are saved is the power of God now the last entity that's going to speak to you is preaching the word of God's going to speak to you the Holy Ghost is going to speak to you and the last thing if you belong unto Christ preaching is going to speak to you now you know what the Bible describes here in Paul speaking really of his own preaching, says the foolishness of preaching. You know, uh, for I, I read this, uh, I read this article, uh, I think Friday at work, and it says now in the modern day, less than three percent of America's population routinely attend church. That leaves ninety-seven percent out there. You know what? People think you are foolish. Don't ever think they think you're the smart one and the noble one. They think you're stupid. They think you're stupid for getting them out, out of bed early on the only day you really could sleep in good and come to a place called church. They think you're foolish for sitting in front of somebody while they're stammering and sputtering about a God you've never even seen. They think you're stupid for writing a check out for 10% of your whole income to a place that does nothing for you, at least in their eyes. You see what I'm saying? But I want you to see here, Paul makes it very clear through the foolishness of preaching. You know what? I've heard some amazing things God revealed to me just by the preaching of the Word of God. And, and they'll work in conjunction. They'll, they'll meet. The first time uh, I heard the doctrine of the election preached, I thought poor old Brother Downs had lost his mind. But you know what? I got home and I read the very words he used for his text. And all I could say is, Blessed be the name of the Lord. See, they were in union. And the Holy Ghost was saying, Yeah, Larry, they're right and you're wrong. <laughs> you, see what, you see what I'm saying? Preaching. Preaching is a good thing. Preaching will, will uh, make the world alive and living before your eyes. Preaching is what we stand in need of the very most in the last day. Uh, preaching is a wonderful thing. Verse 19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, meaning Israel and their high priest. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and, and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Have not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Now, I want you to see, I don't have anything really wrong uh, against Bible classes. I took a few online, and, and, and they can be beneficial. But you know what? They don't preach. You will never learn to preach by going to some foolish class. And I'll, I'll say that without any kind of question. Because it comes from God. And if all they're doing is giving you a little, some little sermonette and reading from a book, listen, you didn't need to start with that. You, I, everyone in this building, what we need is preaching. What you can find about your own spiritual condition is through the Word of God and preaching. Now, now let me say this. You say, why can't I do it just from the Word of God? Well, uh, the only thing I can say is this. If Paul said it was through the books, it's preaching. And I'll give you two thoughts. Number one, without being regenerate, you're not going to spend a whole lot of time in that book. 
You're really not. But when you're here and you're looking at me and you have to listen to look like you're attentive, you got to hear it. And that's the preaching. Right? And then when He saves you and gives you a new life and regenerates you, you'll crave that as much as you do chocolate. Because it will be sweet and good to you then. It'll be something that you enjoy. So it's through the foolishness of preaching. You think about all the magnificent wonders of Christ that has been revealed to you by good old Baptist preachers. Just telling you what they understood and knew. It's a blessed, wonderful thing to hear the preaching of the Word of God. Now, I'll give you the flip side of that. If you get somebody up there preaching heresy, it'll make you want to vomit. Because you, you, your spirit just can't stand to be under it. So we see then as the Lord's people, the Word of God, the Holy Ghost, and preaching is what we need. Verse 21. For after, for after that is the wisdom of God, for after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Now, I've been noticing something, and again, not to be too critical, but just to point out the signs of the times. A lot of times now, when you go to a meeting, they don't say much about preaching. I've heard of even referred to as seminars. Listen, it ain't no seminar. We're, we're talking about the very Son of God. A series of meetings. God help us. We're here to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who cares about a seminar? Who cares about a little talk that somebody does? I want to hear preaching that will help my never dying soul. We need to be very, very cautious when someone comes your way. Know what the Word of God says. Know what the Word of God is teaching. And you know... The Bible says this. Remember, I think it's in 1 Thessalonians. Paul's advice to young Timothy was to try the spirits. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know what we need to do? If I, and, and, and Brother Eric years ago, he probably remember, asked me uh, a question concerning Eve, the mother of all living. And there is a heresy out there, and it comes from the Jewish faith, that Eve wasn't deceived, but it was a different woman. And I used to know her name because I looked it up because he told me. And, and you know what I needed to do? I knew it wasn't in the Bible, but I wondered where it came from. I tried the spirits. I looked into the Word of God. It wasn't there. Okay. I studied out a little bit further and I found out it was a Jewish fable. Uh, and I studied out a little bit further and <laughs> prayed. And the Lord just said, you know, this is trash. This is trash. It it doesn't mean nothing. I tried in the spirits. And you know what? It came out with nothing. And that's that's what we, as the Lord's people, need to do as well. We need to try these things out. So this morning, how are we going to hear from the Lord God? How are we going to evaluate stuff? As the last day approaches, how are we going to get comfort in a world that's being turned literally upside down, it's going to come from these three sources. So what about you? Where do you stand this morning? Are you comfortable with the way things are? Listen, um, whether we think what their capabilities are or not, and I think he's an idiot, but King John Sue, or who, whatever it is, he could reach... The United States right now with nuclear weapons. Uh, and people say, well, it'll never happen. <laughs> you know what I say? I bet Japan thought the same thing. But we dusted two cities in two days, did we not? See, what we need to be is be close into the Lord right now. And the only way that you'll get there is through the Word, through the Spirit, and through preaching. How close are you this morning?